And before I introduce Emily Southgate, I'd like to make um, a couple of announcements about our upcoming presentations. On August 25th, the last Tuesday of the month, we'll have another webinar with Dr. Karen Burkhart, and her topic will be native planting and native plant landscaping from an insect's point of view. So watch for the announcement of that. And on <coughs> August 29th, uh, there will be one of the speakers from the conference that we would have had, uh, Dwayne Estes at 10 a.m. That will also be a webinar. He is the executive director of Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. The other two conference speakers, Jorge Montero and Bill Hilgartner, will be uh, speaking in the evening webinars sometime later in the year. Uh, for tonight, um, our presenter is Dr. Emily Southgate, who is an educator, author, and researcher in ecology and history. She received her BS from Denison University in biology, a master's degree in botany from Duke, another uh, master's in history from Rutgers University, and her PhD in botany um, from Rutgers University. She is the author of a book called People and the Land Through Time, Linking Ecology and History, first published in 1997, and the second edition came out in 2019. This book is the primary text for the field of historical ecology, and it's inspired both ecologists and environmental historians to incorporate each other's perspectives into their work and their research. Um, she has worked extensively with the National Park Service in their cultural parks, providing historical ecological background um, to help guide management of the park's natural resources. She's also active in the environmental community in Virginia. She's on the board of the Virginia Native Plant Society and involved in various citizen science projects. She has taught at Hood College, um, including Woody Plant ID in the Hood College Environmental Science Graduate Program and Historical Ecology as part of Hood's Coastal Studies Seminar. Her current research interests are focused on reconstructing past vegetation patterns and species distributions and relating those to current conditions. Tonight, she's going to speak to us about non-forested landscapes in the mid-Atlantic. So, Emily, you can start sharing your screen. Right. Let's hope it works better than, than yours. <clears throat> uh, looks as if it will. Takes uh, place for it to react. Doesn't seem to want to do that. Well, we'll try this. All right. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> Let me just move uh, this over a little bit myself. Well, this evening, I'm so glad you're all here. Um, this is the first time I've done a webinar, so uh, it's all new to me. I've generally, of course, talked to live audiences. I'm going to talk about the history of open landscapes in the Mid-Atlantic region, mainly because, well, they always have intrigued me, but they also are the focus of a great deal of conservation effort uh, today. And I think it's very important that we look at their history and that will help us understand where they were and what the best methods of managing them are. So there are two observations and two questions. One is that the observation, the first one, climate in the mid-Atlantic, of course, supports forest vegetation, mostly deciduous forest. And I'm going to talk about the Piedmont and Ridge and Valley province and Blue Ridge provinces. I'm not really talking about the coastal plain. So mostly, if it supports forest vegetation, why do we have areas that are non-forested? 
because the Mid-Atlantic also has numerous species of plants and animals that are characteristic of non-forested landscapes. And this raised then three questions, which I'm going to address. Where were these habitats in the pre-colonial landscape before Europeans cut most of the forest down? What factors maintained them at that time? And therefore, what are the consequences of the answers to both of these questions for conservation? So where are they today? Obviously, most are agricultural fields, lawns, golf courses, and they're maintained by intense, extensive, constant human activity. If you don't mow your lawn, it doesn't stay as a lawn. That it, to keep it open, you have to keep putting in a lot of energy. However, there's some open landscapes in wetlands or maybe on steep slopes and on very shallow or unusual soils that seem to be able to survive longer without any human extra effort, efforts. So maybe disturbance is the main factor keeping these open. So what's happening to them today? That's sort of part of what I just said. Most of them, of course, have a history of intense disturbance over the last few centuries. Almost all the forests, not all the forests, but almost all the landscape has been logged either for agriculture or for timber products or for clearing for mines, making charcoal. There are lots of things that have, so even something that's forested and seems to have an old forest, it's certainly likely that it's been logged in the past. But mostly if you don't maintain it, it goes through secondary succession, the way we all learned in ecology, it goes through a meadow phase and then shrubland. This that I'm showing the background for this is a shrubland within the background is sort of arched uh, vegetation is sumac, some blackberries over on the right, and eventually small trees, they're actually small trees scattered in this area, and eventually it becomes a forest. However, some change much more slowly, and those are what I'm mostly focusing on this evening. And just an example from Loudoun County, uh, I got a <coughs> series of aerial photographs from the the uh, mapping department for them from the county. 1957, if you notice, there's a field. In 19, the light color means it's a field. So there's a field right here in 1957. And that field by 2002 had grown up into probably red cedar. You can tell the sort of light color material stuff there is deciduous forest. It's a winter photograph. Trees didn't have leaves. So what's green is probably red cedars, maybe, maybe Pinus virginiana. But there's that patch in the middle that, that's still a field. By 2012, it's still a field. 2019, it's still a field, but it's a little smaller. And this is of interest to the ecologist because it supports, for example, a uh, state rare species, the American Blue Hearts, is a very happy colony there. So why did this stay open? Nobody, as far as anybody knows, has been going in there and making sure trees didn't grow there. So there's some feature that kept that open. So we have two different kinds of open landscapes. We have those that are fields that if we abandon them, they will become forest, and those that are fields that if we abandon them, maybe they don't become forest. So if we want to see where these were in the past, were there many of these in the past? We have this rare species, so it has to have had a habitat somewhere. Well, if we want to look at the long-term history, and these species, of course, evolved over many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, we look at the pollen record. Pollen is really cool. Plants actually leave their own record in sediments for us to study. It, the pollen gives us a record that will go back. I'm going to explain how you do it in a few minutes. Pollen gives us a record that goes back, I just say 17,000 years, because that's sort of the post-glacial record that we can see pretty well in the eastern U.S. It can go back much longer than that. It has a temporal resolution, so if you want to say how long was this here, maybe 50, maybe a little less, some spaces, but it depends on how the sediment was dated. And, uh, and a mixing, there's a constant mixing of sediment usually. So it gives us a temporal resolution of 50 years or so. A spatial scale, usually tens of kilometers. So you can't really use this technique to say, was that little uh, open area I showed you in Loudoun County in that same place 
a thousand years ago because it would have been swallowed up in the whole general landscape picture unless you had a little uh, sedimentary basin right there in that space. So if we want to be more specific, we go to historical documents. Historical documents in, in Eastern North America, of course, only go back about 400 years, but that's quite useful. We have ethnographic descriptions of Native American activities. Oral history in this region for land use is probably <clears throat> a little difficult to deal with because populations, of course, were devastated <clears throat> and many of the local people uh, were shipped off uh, far away so that it's difficult to do that. <clears throat> the temporal resolution of historical documents is really nice because it can be exact like at one year, maybe even a day, and very precise in terms of space. So we could find that special little place if we could find a record there. And there's short-term evidence also in the field. For example, bits of, uh, of charcoal from a fire can be incorporated in the soil and you can sometimes identify those, at least a genus, uh, maybe. So that tells you what kind of, whether it was a tree, whether there were trees growing there, and some little silica bodies called, silica, called phytoliths, which also tell us what was growing there. And again, the temporal resolution can be fairly precise there, and the spatial resolution is possibly very precise. So first I'm gonna talk about the long-term record and tell you a little about pollen. Those of you who don't know how, what pollen is all about and how that can help us. Oh, before I do that, let me just go back one slide. The background here is pollen, the background of this slide. It shows three pollen grains. Just to tell you that they're very distinctive, we can identify pollen, old pollen. This is hemlock, this great big bumpy thing. This, oh, phooey. Uh, this uh, is birch over here that's very smooth and has three little pores. And this right here is, uh, that's a little rougher, is, um, is uh, oak. So, <clears throat> what can it tell us? Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my mechanics here. Um, okay, so it goes back, as I said, 17,000 years ago. And if we're looking at open species, species of open sites, we really, it's pretty important to get an idea of their long-term history. Some of them are more related to species out west. Some are more related to species in the east, north, some farther south. Well, when the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which is the last ice sheet of the ice age that we're actually in right now, was here, as you can see, it extended down just barely into New Jersey and northeastern Pennsylvania. It never, none of the glaciations in the most recent ice age, no glaciations reached Delaware, uh, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware. None of these areas has ever been glaciated, actually which has some consequences for looking at pollen. I'll talk about that in a second. But you look at the lobe of the Laurentide ice sheet that's, that reaches down into Indiana, species that were growing in say where Wisconsin is now, or where lower Michigan is now, would have been forced south, but some of them might have, had to, might have moved east. So this would help account for why we have species that come from the west is that they were, as the glacier moved south, of course, species were killed. And if they had propagules that made it and survived south of where it was cold, they survived there. But even so, it was pretty cold in areas like where we are now, Maryland, Northern Virginia, it was very cold uh, when that glacier was up there. Oops. How'd I go backwards? That's weird. I don't know why I'm going backwards now. I wasn't able to go backwards before. Uh, so pollen, how does pollen tell us what was growing and gives us some idea of this? We've all had to wipe oak pollen off our windshields in the spring. We know that there's a lot of it produced. If you've ever lived in an area or you live in the, uh, out on the coastal plain, areas with a lot of pines, you have even more pollen. Pollen, as we all know, carries the sperm to the egg. And if an insect carries it, it goes from one flower to the next flower. The plant puts a lot of effort into the flowers to attract the insect because the insect will carry it where it should go. 
plants like oaks, pines, birch, ragweed, grasses don't do that. They rely on the wind to carry their pollen. And if you rely on the wind to carry your pollen, you'd better produce a lot of it. To give you an idea, something weird is happening here. Uh, this is in the pine barrens in New Jersey in spring. And that yellow stuff here on the side of this little lake is pine pollen. That pollen, it was so thick, it looked like white, yellow paint on the side of this lake. I was with some friends, it was hot, I wanted to go wading, and they said, ooh, there's paint on the lake. And I said, no, no, it's not paint, it's just pollen. They still didn't believe me and didn't wade. It was very cool, lovely. <coughs> but this pollen is floating there on surface tension, of course, with wave action. It eventually goes underground, sinks to the bottom, and settles with all the rest of the sediment in the, on the bottom of the, of the whatever body of water this is, a lake, or also it can do that on a bog as well. <clears throat> and it accumulates with the rest of the material down there. I'm sure you've all been in lakes, been swimming in uh, ponds and lakes, and walked in and there's sort of this mucky stuff that comes up between your toes. Slightly slippery, slimy, not exactly slimy, just silky. That's uh, called Hitya, G-Y-T-T-A, <coughs> excuse me, which is lake sediment. That's a Finnish name for this. And it eventually solidifies as it keeps being packed down. It gets mixed in the surface and that's what makes it, uh, gives you this running average. It sinks to the bottom and accumulates and the, what's lower you hope is older and then it's younger and younger as you go higher in the sediment. Just a summary, the, on the left I have some hazel which is producing pollen in large amounts from those catkins sliding out of the surface of the lake, this is Lake Mohawk by the way in upstate New York, beautiful spot, sinks to the bottom. Then you have this problem, how do we get the record out of the bottom of the lake? How do we get mud out of the bottom of the lake? We need a core a deep core from the bottom of the lake. It's, you can do it from boats, it's sort of difficult, there's wave action, you gotta have triple anchors to make it not move around because you have to keep going down one meter at a time through a casing in order to sample. It's much easier from a solid surface, as you can see this uh, class from New York University with Dr. Calvin Heuser sampling through the ice in New York State. We got about an eight I think about an eight meter core, they're out there all day. It, uh, it's a nice surface to work from, except that everything freezes, of course, when you get it up into the air when it's down around 20 degrees. But you get this, so you have a whole lot of mud. You've carefully kept it stratigraphically uh, distinct, so you know what's the bottom and what's the top, and you can subsample at different depths to get different times in the past. This, pollen this sediment was deposited. But it's just mud. Uh, you look at it and it's just mud. If you've done field work and you've gone out and counted, uh, done plots and counted species of plants and cover or counted trees, you know, at the end of the day you have a vague idea what you've got. But if you do pollen analysis, you've collected a core, what you have is mud. It just looks like mud. I always have to put a little slide, a bit of it on a microscope slide and see if maybe I find something really interesting. But basically you have to treat it in order to get rid of the rest of the stuff in that sediment. Uh, this is, we can do this because the pollen grain has a shell. It's very resistant to decay. As long as it is, does not have oxygen and moisture, it will last for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years without decaying. The insides, the cellular contents decompose, but the outside, the shell does not. So it's not only resistant to oxidation from moisture and oxygen, but it also is resistant to a lot of chemicals. So we treat that mud with, uh, with hydrochloric acid to dissolve the carbonates, with potassium hydroxide to dissolve the tannins, with hydrofluoric acid to dissolve the silicates, uh, 
and a mixture of acetic anhydride and concentrated sulfuric acid to dissolve the cellulose. So we, we really treat it with pretty nasty things. And if we're lucky, we end up with a material that we can put on the microscope slide that looks like this with mostly pollen grains. The, that background slide I showed was one. This is another. The top right, that cute little grain up there that's sort of elongated with three slits and very nice holes in the middle of those slits is castania or chestnut. You have to think they're sort of cute because you spend, this is magnified 400 times, maybe 410 I think, with this scope, high power, and you scan back and forth across slides, counting, identifying and counting pollen grains for eight hours a day for months. So if you don't think some of them are cute, it's really, really more tedious than, you know, I don't see how you could do it. You have to have your favorites that you're looking for, and chestnuts one. Anyway, there's oak farther down. This looks quercus. This looks a little different from the one you saw before, if you can remember, um, because these are three-dimensional bodies and they can roll over. And we use a viscous medium so we can turn them over. And then ragweed, ambrosia, uh, down in the bottom left, is, uh, is a little sort of spiny and has three slits. So the three cool things about pollen, there's a lot of it, so you can get a statistical sample. It's very resistant to decay if it's in no, low oxygen conditions. So it's gonna be there. And thirdly, you can identify most pollen grains to genus, some even to species, like some of the maples, most just to genus. Unfortunately, for example, oak, you can only say it's oak. You can't say what kind. Charcoal, I show you one piece. There happened to be one on this slide. That's probably a vessel element that was burned. And you can also look at the charcoal to get an idea of what's happened uh, in terms of fires in the vicinity of a body of water. So you've had, you have this core, it's collected sediment over some period of time, and you take subsamples at different depths, and then you put those all together in a pollen diagram to try to tell you how the proportions of these taxa have changed over time. And I'm gonna show you data from three sites. Uh, they're not very many, I, I forgot to say, I mentioned the problem of being south of the terminal moraine, the glaciers really messed up the drainage. And so if you're north of where the most recent glaciation was, there are lots of bodies that you can sample, not lots of water bodies, either lakes or bogs. However, when you're farther south, where we are, there are no natural lakes in Maryland, and there are probably only two natural lakes in Virginia, and one of them, Mountain Lake, occasionally just drains Whenever a lake drains, the sediment dries up and the sediment becomes oxidized so the pollen can be seriously damaged. But I did find some results from three different sites. Uh, Chesapeake Bay, a core from the Chesapeake Bay. Dr. Grace Brush, when she uh, moved to Johns Hopkins University, everyone said there's no place you can do pollen, there are no lakes. She said, what about the bay? They said, oh, that won't work. She tried that and found that it actually worked pretty well. This is not her core that I'm talking about, we'll be talking about, but it was inspired by her work. Then there's a lake in uh, western, sort of in uh, the Shenandoah Valley, southern Shenandoah Valley into the mountains, called Hack Pond, and then Cranesville Swamp, which some of you are familiar with in western Maryland. So your data are expressed in this thing called a pollen diagram. Those of us who study fossil pollen love pollen diagrams. Other people maybe not quite as much, but I sort of like them. They are dated by radiocarbon. There's, there's, fortunately, there's usually enough carbon material in the sediment to give you a decent radiocarbon date. This core, the dates more recently than 10,000 years ago were not very good. All the three uh, pollen studies I'm going to show you, I got from the North American Pollen Database, which is an open source database. Uh, researchers submit their data. It's available for anyone who wants to use it and manipulate it. Uh, there's another feature that you can go find, a, you know, you look at the map and you find, say, oh, I wanna look at this, this uh, pond, the pollen study from this pond, and you can say, I want to see a pollen diagram, and it draws this diagram for you. 
you don't have any choice about what's included in it, but it'll give us a general picture. And I'm not gonna look at any of the details because it's way too much. We're mainly looking at what's the evidence in the pollen record for there being any non-forested uh, places in the landscape. So we can see that before, what this shows, so let me, <laughs> I'll just tell you, say at the bottom, the deepest sample right down here had no alder, tiny bit of birch, no hickory, little bit of hazel, a lot of spruce, a lot of pine, maybe 35% spruce, 55% pine, 50% no oak, Asteroid E undifferentiated, it had, that's the Asteraceae that have disc flowers. That's, that is, that's the ones that, that's eliminating the ones that only have ray flowers like uh, um, uh, chicory and dandelion. It had a little bit of sedge, tiny bit of grass, and a few other things. A few upland, other upland herbs. You notice other upland herbs here. So because these, uh, herbaceous plants are producing pollen right near the ground. They never are going to contribute as much as the trees because the trees are throwing pollen up in the air and gets carried around much more easily. Uh, I don't know what that's all about. Um, and so what this shows us, if we had a spruce pine forest, definitely, so a sort of boreal forest. It was pretty cold then in this area. It was not an oak forest up to 10,000 years ago. And there was certainly a certain amount of open, probably tundra-like environment at that time. Somewhere around 10,000 years ago, I think there's some kind of hiatus in this core, we had a huge increase in oak, and that's characteristic for the entire eastern, northeastern U.S. There's a big increase in oak 10 to 7,000 years ago, depending on how far north you are. So oak, as you can see, that big blob of oak, that dominates the vegetation uh, with some pine um, for the rest of the, you know, up to the present or up to the highest, the most recent sediment in this lake, which it may be truncated at the top and not the amount to today. Uh, there was hickory, you can see on the left, caria. Uh, so there was some hickory. And again, we're looking mainly at these. There was a lot less of these non-tree. There was a little bit of sedge, a little grass, and a tiny, tiny bit of other upland herbs. But there were some other upland herbs. And again, for those to be in there at all means they were somewhere in the general area. Cranesville Swamp, I wanted to put in because uh, I know some of you are familiar with this. This core was not dated. So I can't tell you exactly how old this um, sediment is, but you can see the same pattern, spruce and pine at the bottom, and then an increase in oak. In this case, there's some kind of blip in hemlock. I don't know why. Uh, but you see then, coming up to more close to the present, there's a big increase in shrubs. So this must have been a spruce pine, probably a depression fairly deep depression because it filled up for, it had 300, three meters worth of sediment accumulated over the time period that is represented here. So it was filling up and at a certain point it became a shrub swamp. It's a fen, I guess, not a, it's not a bog, it's not a raised bog. But it continued, early on it had a lot of sedges and then that was probably covered up by these uh, shrubs, the alder. But you see there's still Asteraceae here and sedges and a few grasses. So there were probably a certain number, other terrestrial vascular plants. Um, that's, I don't know for sure, it could be sedges. There's one other thing I wanna note on this and that's this big increase in Asteraceae right here, the very surf, oops, at the very top. And that is related to European agriculture. So when farmers started clearing the fields and they started cutting down the forest, you consistently get a big increase in ragweed, which represents the landscape we have today. Chesapeake Bay, this is a much shorter core. This, this I don't know how deep this is, but it it's 2,000 years worth of sediment. 
oak again, <coughs> oak and pine throughout. Again, other upland herbs on the right, you notice they're always present all the way through here. Grass is always present. Ragweed is very low until about eight, about 800 years ago. You see an increase here in ragweed. That's about the time maize agriculture came into this region. Maize agriculture was not here until probably 800,000 years ago. So that could very well be Native American fields. And then there's a peak of ragweed and what happens above that is very hard to interpret, but that's probably European uh, colonization there. So this very quick and dirty uh, summary with some of these cores tell us overall that the early post-glacial, we had a spruce pine landscape. There was open land, probably quite cold, but it certainly gave habitats for some of these open land species. The last 9,000 or so years, oak and pine dominated with less open land, but certainly still some. And then the last 500 years, rapid clearance, ragweed and other herbaceous plants, a, a tremendous increase in the amount of open land, huge increase. The decrease in open land in the last century, I don't show that well, but we all know that's, that's happened as people have abandoned their farms. But now let's go to the historical documents and see what they'll tell us. And I'm gonna give this an example, the Maryland Barrens, because there's some really excellent evidence for that. And some of you are familiar with Soldier's Delight Natural Area. I've been there, actually, I went there in 1968. My first job was teaching at St. Timothy's School and uh, being a botanist, I had to go out and see Soldier's Delight Natural Area, which may have looked sort of like this. I don't have pictures. The Maryland Barrens, the, the other feature of this whole area, of course, is serpentine deposits. It's a kind of rock which generally does not form very good soils. They're shallow and they're also very high in magnesium and low in calcium. So they're not particularly good soils for growing trees or crops. They're very good for mining, chromite, uh, asbestos, talc, lots of different minerals are mined there. And they've been mapped very clearly by the geologists. So this is a map of the serpentine barrens in, uh, in Maryland up into Pennsylvania. So they come through this in a sort of southwest northeast trending line. They're most prevalent here at the state line, because they're called the state line barrens. Here's Soldier's Delight down here. So can we can we relate can we relate those to where there were open areas in the 18th century, the barrens that are open today? We can look at land surveys. Land sur the the, pre -col the colonial land was surveyed what, by what are called meets and bounds surveys. These were a surveyor would mark a point, go in a certain direction, mark, and a certain distance and mark another point, go in another direction, mark another point. Frequently they mentioned trees in these points and I've done a lot of work on the trees and what they tell us about what was growing, the kinds of trees that were growing. They're very precise. They provide dates of surveys, they're spatially accurate and precise. You can map them, you can see those lines today on uh, topograph, on um, aerial photography. Yet there are some of those are still property lines. The other thing that's particularly good for what I'm looking at today is they frequently describe unusual vegetation or land cover. They don't, in, the, in this area, they don't mention the forests because it was forest, you don't say, well, we marked this tree in the forest, we marked that tree in the forest, we marked another tree in the forest and another tree in the forest. But they do say things like we marked a tree in a meadow. And you say, aha, a meadow. And I summarized all of those for Frederick County, uh, Virginia, which is in the Shenandoah Valley, or this includes a lot of land in the Shenandoah Valley, and found that they do record meadows and marshes there are these early ideas that all of the Shenandoah Valley, there were huge savannas there. Well, these meadows and marshes are only found along the limestone creeks. So that gives us the historical de de evidence, tells us where we would have found these. They wouldn't have been everywhere, but they were local. Also, there are other documents and so on that are very useful. 
ads for property, which you have to look at a little the way you would today. You know, are they really telling you the truth? Uh, travelers' descriptions and so on. And uh, so to give you an idea of the surveys, uh, the state line barons in Pennsylvania, you can see uh, highlighted, this is the survey of a piece of property. And it noted that it was situate in the Pine Barrens. And I looked at all of the surveys for the areas in the Pennsylvania and state line barrens. And consistently, where there are barrens now, they mentioned barrens then, and they did not mention barrens anywhere else. That doesn't give us boundaries, because if it says situate in the Pine Barrens, this is uh, 111 acres. We don't know whether you know, it's in the middle of the Pine Barrens, is it a little of Pine Barrens, but at least we know they're in that general vicinity. Uh, a historian, Dr. William Mary, studied the evidence for the Great Maryland Bar Barrens, and he did a super amazing job. He went to all sorts of different collections, looked at all sorts of descriptions of property and, and surveys, and he summarized it in this article in the Maryland Historical Magazine. Well, he didn't just summarize it, he, his text summarized it, but because he said it's probable that nobody else is gonna go back and get pull all this together again, he actually transcribed most of those documents into his footnotes. So that article has more footnotes than text. But there's just one example that's particularly interesting. And that is, this was a piece of property in 1721 in Harford County near Susquehanna River, which is where the state line barons are. He started at an intersection with the barons, this line, this property line did. And it went from there, south 139 degrees west, 160 perches, joining the barons over there. So it started near the barons and went over to barons, so it must be sort of along an edge. And in 1732, they found, ah, wait, there's more good land. We didn't quite get to the edge of the good land. We can go another 50 perches before we get to the barons. So let's include that good land in this property. And what this tells us is first of all, that the barons were consistently seen as not having good soils. And secondly, that there was a well-defined and abrupt boundary, which would certainly suggest that the, the basis for these was a geological basis. That is, there was a ge geological line. You got across that line, you had barons. Other side of the line, you had good soils. So he, he um, oops, sorry, let me go back a minute. Uh, uh, so Mr. Mary, summarized all of these data and more or less verbally mapped where the barons were. I don't know the rivers and the landmarks he was mentioning well enough. He did not have a physical map, so I couldn't really see that. But my impression was that he was convinced that they did correspond with the geological, uh, geological basis. He also talked about what happened afterwards or how they were used. They were mined as early as 1722. They were describing going out there, searching for mines on the serpentine. They knew that was where you would find mines at different vegetation. And it had, that's, they knew they were finding mines there. In addition to mines, it was used, it was grazed extensively and the farmers burned over it to improve the grazing. So that was, uh, so it had really heavy use for from the early 18th century through the present. So why were they there in the 18th century? It seems quite likely the geological substrate was inhibiting tree growth. There's also the possibility that today, of course, in those barrens, we have a problem that trees are growing back in them. So if it's just geology, and Mr. Mary also talked about that, it doesn't seem to be just geology. So maybe there was a, some kind of a disturbance factor that was important as well. Lightning ignited fires maybe inhibited the tree growth. There are those who also say that it's likely that Native Americans set fires, prevented the trees from growing there. And that's why we have the barrens there, is because the Native Americans were burning them. And others have suggested that herbivores, like deer, elk, and buffalo, for example, maintained them. And of course, if 
if you stop doing these things, as we have stopped doing it in a lot of areas, they're not being grazed by cattle. Um, they're not being burned because they've got, they're surrounded by areas that don't burn because they're subdivisions or if there's a fire, not as many places for fires to start, trees begin to grow back. Dr. Mary, I, I keep referring back to him because I, I was so impressed with what he did and I didn't know the area, but I wanted to do something for Maryland for you. And it, the, the idea was that at a certain point, the Susquehanna, Susquehanna Indians came in and they said, we want to open this up, let's burn the forest and we'll burn the forest down and that will give us, destroy the forest and give us an open area. And he really feels that that's pretty unlikely that just burning it, that doesn't work that way. That he has it on good authority that the York Barrens were poor land and very low rating as arable land. So this was bad soil to start with. And that maybe even before there were human set fires, this area was covered with scrubby pines, uh, oaks, shrub oaks, sassafras, which actually burned really well, and locust saplings. And fire would occasionally start in those and burn them. That is naturally caused fires. And that perhaps as the Native Americans were moving around there, and becoming more settled in the last 200, in the last thousand years, they said, ah, this is a good place. Look, fire strike here and we get it burned off and there are more deer, elk, buffalo, whatever growing there. We can start doing fires. There's considerable evidence that Native Americans uh, used fire to manage local ecosystems to produce uh, crops or products that they wanted. So I'm going to look at the different possible causes. The geological substrate certainly seems like the 18th century surveys, where there were bad soils, they were on serpentine. It seems to be corresponded pretty well and the bar bar boundary was pretty abrupt. The problem, of course, with this being the cause of these open areas is that there was agriculture on some of the edges of this. So the soil obviously wasn't so bad that trees couldn't grow and trees grew even in the late 18th century and trees are growing there now. And this is a big concern for, the, for those who are trying to conserve these open habitats. So what about lightning ignited fires? Are they would they have been sufficient to maintain these as open land? Because you, you went from the pre-colonial period to the colonial period of, from then until the present where it was heavily used and grazed and so that would help keep trees out regardless of fire. So there have been estimates that there are plenty of lightning, ground to lightning fire, a lightning cloud to ground lightning flashes to start enough fires. Of course, we've all had those. I was afraid they might be happening tonight and cut out my internet. Droughts can produce dry vegetation. We can all see that right now. We've got some dry vegetation. And it's also possible that old dead trees, which are hit by lightning, can smolder until the ground dries and then ignite fires if the ground, if the vegetation, the fuel is quite dry. I talked to a, a fire ecologist at Shenandoah National Park a few years ago, and she was able to tell me that yes, in, uh, in Shenandoah Park, there was a fire, I don't know, in the last 20 years or so, 10 years, that they were able to trace back to an old tree, which was struck by lightning, and then eventually ignited the fire. Because of course, the problem is that most of the time we have lightning, we have a lot of rain, and so it doesn't start many fires. But under certain conditions, it definitely can. What about Native American set fires? When you talk about this, and I just read another article, they say, ah, they smell smoke off the coast. That's really good evidence that the forests were being burned and that open areas were maintained by fires. Well, you know, this was Peter de Vries in a ship off the coast, and he smelled smoke from a, from a forest fire. And he said, aha, or he wrote in his little diary, aha, that's because the Native Americans are burning the forest every year. Um, I don't know, I don't find that terribly convincing of what was going on. 
So what else have we got? We have some references to Native Americans setting fires for hunting. They have this amazing thing that's described. It's a circular fire. So they, they burned, they got in a big circle with deer in the middle and they set fires so that it burned into the middle and drove all the deer in together in the middle. Now, when I think about that, I don't know, I've been, I've been present at, not really done much for, quite a few controlled burns. And you know, these only burn in one direction. Now the wind can shift and it can burn in another direction. But the idea, you'd have to have a pretty big circle because otherwise you'd spook the deer. And you'd all have to start your fires at the same time and have a continuous ring of fire and make noise and stuff because the deer would of course sneak out if they could find a gap. Um, and you'd have to have all the fires burning toward each other, which I find to be difficult. So I don't know, and, and at the most that would be only the area that was burned for that fire hunt. There's evidence their, their references to their clearing the uh, forest for hunting, oops, forest for hunting, using fires. But of course that's clearing the forest, that's not opening up a hole. That says that they can burn the fire forest and maintain an oak forest. That's not using fire to open up a forest and make it into an open prairie type condition. Um, and the farmers set fires in the pastures, and there's some guesses, maybe they learned that from the Native Americans, which it's certainly possible. We have some problems with this as a cause. There's really little or no, I'm sorry, little of no, little or no local evidence of native set fires, uh, as far as I know, right around here. And two of the early 18th century observers of these barrens attributed to the barrens to poor soil and didn't mention native set fires. And actually in all the surveys I've read, land surveys, I've run into only one that had a burnt stump and I was pretty excited about that burnt stump. This is an early, like early 18th century survey. Talked to somebody who'd done work in um, the same kind of habitats in uh, Fairfax County. He had found a burnt stump too. We were both excited until we realized it was the same burnt stump for two pieces of property, one on either side of the Loudoun Fairfax County line. So it was fairly minimal as evidence. Uh, just, just I, I did have to throw a pile in with uh, charcoal in here. There's a really extreme example of <clears throat> the increase in fires with European colonization. There's the Rome Sand Plains in upstate New York. It's a Nature Conservancy site. Um, I did a pollen core for them and I looked at charcoal. You can see there's a little bit of charcoal on the right. That's the figure on the right. Um, a huge peak right at the top, which corresponds with the huge peak. It's the next, uh, the, the left right here. So this is the, the charcoal peak and here's the ragweed peak. So that's European settlement. This could be Native American agriculture increasing the amount of fire. But consistently throughout <coughs> the Northeast, uh, there's an increase in charcoal with European colonization. So the other possibility, maybe herbivores were really important. Um, there certainly were white-tailed deer here. Uh, they grow in the, of course, in the forest as well as the edges, but their population size density is very much lower in the forest if they don't have edges and open fields to graze in. Uh, there are references to elk and buffalo in Maryland and intense grazing of any kind can certainly prevent tree regeneration. So they could certainly have been a factor. Problems where neither buffalo nor elk were very common. Buffalo were definitely more common farther south in what they call cane breaks. Um, that's um, Rundin area uh, in wet areas usually. The elk in the east, there's some evidence that they actually lived in the forests. And of course, current grazing by deer, it doesn't seem to keep the trees from regenerating on those forest stand, on those uh, barrens. So what I would conclude here is that soil and other substrate characteristics were critical factors for locating these open areas. And on top of those substrate characteristics, a disturbance factor, maybe in those we see today, there have been post-colonial uh, changes, erosion, in some places would be important, mining maybe affecting topography and or tailings. 
and grazing, which could have enriched the soil. However, I think that a disturbance factor on top of the soils is probably quite important. Uh, we have no idea of the frequency and intensity of previous fires, and it's certainly likely that Native Americans increased the size of these by their activities, but when and for how long, we don't know. Their cultures, of course, changed over a long period of time. They didn't necessarily main, stay do the same thing over 10,000 years. So I answer the original questions, where were the open habitats? I think they were mainly where special conditions existed, like in the Shenandoah Valley along these limestone creeks or in, um, in Maryland Barrens where the soil, serpentine soils were, and they were maintained by the special soils and topography plus some kind of disturbance. So the consequences for conservation, you only have a limited amount of money you can spend on conservation. Unfortunately, we can't conserve everything we would like to. Seems to me that it makes a lot of sense to focus on areas that were open between, before European land clearance. These require less energy probably to maintain them. You can see that little plot there in Loudoun County, which it remarkably remained. I have no idea why it's there. Um, and these conditions may actually relate more to the evolutionary history of these, these uh, species. Soils and topography are critical and fire or some disturbance and probably fire is the most likely one were also important. So those are my conclusions and uh, I'm going to end with a uh, leave a picture of my the, the cover of my um, my book um, while we do the question and answer uh, people in the land through time linking ecology and history and it's a discussion of the field of historical ecology and how historical studies can contribute to our understanding uh, ecological processes and also therefore contribute to conservation as well. So I'd like to open it up to a uh, question and answer and I don't quite know how we do this. Well, I'm going to look at the Q&A and relay the questions to you, Emily. Okay. Um, first, we have some questions about pollen. The first one is, if moisture breaks down pollen grains, why doesn't being in a lake break them down? Uh, that's a good, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that very well. If they sort of floated around in the water where it's highly oxygenated for a long period of time, it would break them down. But because they're denser than water, once they get below the surface tension, they settle to the bottom and bottoms of lakes usually have much, particularly deep lakes, have uh, very low oxygen content. So it's, it's, uh, it's basically the bottom of the lake is more anoxic and sufficiently anoxic for the pollen grains to survive. Our next question about pollen is from Wendy. How wide are the core slices that are analyzed as a unit? It depends very much on, on, the, on a lot of factors. Uh, some people analyze their cores at very tight intervals. Say the core was two meters long, they would analyze it every five meters, uh, five, I mean five centimeters. And at each centimeter, they would at, at each, say every five, they take centimeters four to five out and then uh, nine to 10 out and they would then take one cubic centimeter of that sediment and treat it. It's really quite remarkable when you, it's incredibly consistent over space in representing the, the forest vegetation and the general vegetation. Um, and when you consider that it's one core of mud in a lake and you take one cubic centimeter of sediment and of that you analyze probably just a couple of drops on your microscope slide and you get a representation of the vegetation, the trees that were growing within about 10 kilometers of that lake. Okay, now we're um, turning to some more uh, questions more focused on the barrens. The first one was, what was mined in the barrens? Oh, uh, Chromite was one of the main elements, uh, main ores that was taken out of there. It was also uh, asbestos and talc. 
and I don't know, there are a bunch of other minerals as well. It was very, very valuable for mining. But chromite, asbestos, and talc are the three that I know best. Others probably know more than I do about that. And another person wondered if you could talk about the role of colonial charcoaling. Oh, colonial charcoaling um, mostly happened in the, in the mountains um, for two reasons. One, those are the areas that were not as good for farming. So that, that meant you had extensive forests that were not already cut down and could be made into charcoal. And also that was closer to where the iron ore was. So the charcoal was mostly made for treating iron ore. I don't know whether the smelting of chromite involved charcoal or not. So I don't know what kind of logging, but there wouldn't have been enough uh, trees really probably to make charcoal there along the, um, in the, in the barrens. It's mostly in the uplands and it's done usually on like a 30 year cycle, more or less. So trees that are about 30 years old, you can cut them down again and make charcoal again. But in the mountains all the way, uh, the Catoctans, um, I, I don't know how much of the Blue Ridge, I don't know that there's iron ore there, but certainly the Catoctans were heavily uh, cut over for charcoal. Another attendee has asked whether American chestnut was much of a component in this mid-Atlantic region at any time. Ah, that's, <clears throat> that's interesting because actually the, there's considerable, there's complete consistency really between the pollen record. As you saw, you didn't see much chestnut in those pollen diagrams. They were more or less representing the major taxa that are represented and um, in the pollen. And they didn't include much chart, much chestnut. Generally, you had oak, pine maybe, and then hickory, hickory and a little chestnut. And in the 18th century surveys, there's mostly oak, particularly white oak, then chestnut, I mean, then hickory and then chestnut. So chestnut was usually not more than maybe 5% of the, uh, the trees that were counted and that, that can be tallied from those 18th century land surveys. There were local areas, there would be um, stands of chestnut that were dense, but they were not extensive. But what happened is Europeans came in and they cut for charcoal and they cut for other, they logged for other reasons and chestnut responded very favorably to logging. It came up, it sprouted very vigorously from the stumps and the seedlings grew quite well. And so by the late 19th century, it was a very major part of the forest. So that was when the chestnut blight hit. But it had not been a major component regionally of the forest in the pre-colonial forest. As I say, but locally, there were places where it was very important. Well, next, Michael Wilpers asks whether there is any evidence such as bones of large bison herds in the mid-Atlantic that could have maintained grasslands? And if there is any, during what periods, what time periods? I've, I've never seen any evidence of that. That doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, actually, the more, the more interesting question is, what were the mastodons doing? But that's, that's a different, quite a different issue and pretty far back. But references to buffalo are not, that don't seem to be generally all over the place in this region. I, I read a description of them from the uh, Robert Byrd who surveyed the, the line between Virginia and North Carolina. And he described the buffalo and said there weren't that many that they were generally much more common farther south and in what they call cane breaks, which are these big arendinaria, uh, usually lowland sites. But for example, there's a description of seeing uh, extensive uh, open areas near uh, the Shenandoah River. That could have been floodplain areas that were, um, were cane breaks and did have buffalo. But certainly, I just haven't run into much of that. 
Um, before we go on to the next question, there was a comment uh, from Sam Drogi about chestnut, saying chestnut is at least partially insect pollinated and therefore may not be putting out that much pollen into the air. Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, it, it's insect pollinated, but it also, of course, has catkins and it does produce a fair amount of windblown pollen as well as having its pollen carried by insects. I was sort of curious because it's it, that's definitely an issue, for example, with maple. Uh, maple is insect strongly insect pollinated and is very underrepresented in the pollen record. But when you put when you look at the surveyors' records, they also don't find much chestnut. So that that's consistent with the pollen record. Now, and also some sites, I, I did one core and I had maybe at one point in it, I may have had about 10 to 15% of the pollen was chestnut. So that told me that in that local area, there was plenty of chestnut. So if there's a lot of chestnut in the forest, it does show up in the pollen. But that, yeah, that's a very good point. Um. Next question, is there evidence of burning forests by Native Americans in the Washington, D.C. area? Not that I have seen. That doesn't mean there isn't, but I haven't ever read any, I don't think. You know, <laughs> I hate to be, you know, I, I'm not absolutely certain, but I don't think that there is. There's, I mean, they're the general things like descriptions of the land being open and you could ride through it, that the forests were not very thick. But that, you know, if you have a really well-developed forest, actually the trees shade out a lot of the understory and it's not a very shrubby understory necessarily. Um, so those, but those are sometimes attributed the Native Americans set fires, but there's no description of the Native Americans setting those fires. I had first, when I started working on my dissertation at Rutgers, I was, you know, I'd heard that the Native Americans burned the forest and that's why they were oak forests instead of being in New Jersey, rather than being um, hemlock and northern hardwoods. Because if you, hemlock and northern hardwoods grow up, we see a lot of, uh, I mean, a beach, growing up under the forest and red and sugar maple, growing up under oak forests and oak forests not regenerating. And I wanted to see if I could go back using pollen to before the Native Americans were burning the forest. So when we had, maybe there were hemlock northern hardwood forests. And I talked to an anthropologist in New Jersey who was the person who, who knew the most about the Native Americans. And I said, so what's the, anthropological or ethnographical evidence for Native Americans burning the forest. And he said, oh, I don't think they did it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> because this was the first I had heard anyone suggest that that hadn't been happening. And the more I looked into it, the less convincing I found the historical record for their setting extensive fires over long periods of time regularly. Another question is, uh, there are some historical accounts of savannas and grasslands being common in the Triassic basins compared to the surrounding Piedmont. Is there good evidence for this? Can you repeat that? I didn't, it was a little, oops, sorry, I don't know what I did. Uh, there are some historical accounts of savannas and grasslands being common in the Triassic basins compared to the surrounding Piedmont. Is there good evidence for this? I haven't seen any. That doesn't mean it's not there, but I haven't seen any. I don't think that um, uh, Dr. Cronenberg, I think his name is, who did the study of the Fairfax County, uh, the surveys there, I think the only open land, the main open land he found in Fairfax County was uh, was uh, what they call poison fields. We don't know what those are. <laughs> They're scattered around, um, but that that wouldn't be extensive uh, open areas. And in Loudoun County, 
I haven't found any evidence either. I haven't looked at all of the surveys for the far eastern part of the county. Jane Hill asks, in pollen analysis, how do you account for differences in productivity of pollen by different species? There are several ways you do that. First, as uh, Sam Drogi said, there's some species that are insect pollinated and you know they're going to be underrepresented. Uh, in addition, there have been a lot of studies uh, looking at pollen in surface sediment compared to surveys of current vegetation and comparing those two. So there are a lot of uh, statistical studies looking for analogs of pollen, uh, pollen profiles, well, surface surface pollen, uh, pollen can be collected. Pollen doesn't decompose really fast, so you can actually collect pollen on one of the favorite things for current uh, pollen production is to look at moss pollsters because you can actually take some moss and treat it the way you would sediment and you'll get a record of what kind of pollen was coming out of the air. So there are lots of ways that's been done. It's not an exact science at all, but it's, it's, it's just remarkably consistent. Um, it, to learn all this, these ins and outs of pollen, and as I said, I've done just, just a tiny bit here, is I like I, at Rutgers, I taught a, um, a one semester graduate seminar learning to do pollen analysis. So there's a lot to, um, to all these, these questions. Um, someone has commented Emily, that it would be helpful for you to repeat the question because my audio is crackly. So our next question is from Kevin Dodge, um, who said, thanks for a really informative presentation, Dr. Southgate. You focused on the Piedmont Barrens. Could you please comment on the open and sparsely forested habitats further west in the Ridge and Valley e.g. shale barrens, limestone woodlands. There's debate about the role of fire versus geological conditions in maintaining these openings. What is the role of the warmer post-glacial time periods in the spread of some western prairie species, such as Cytote's grandma, into these areas? Okay, I won't repeat that whole question, but it had to do with the farther west open areas and what might have been maintaining those and the importance of the, uh, the warm period in the post-glacial in species migrating east from the Midwest. And I think, I think out there, you mentioned, he mentioned shale barrens. I think again, it's a matter of looking at the geological substrate and what kind of disturbance in addition would be, you know, if those are forested today, what can you find in the soils? What can you find in historical records indicating that they were not forested in the past? You need to, you know, it's, it's a lot of research to figure this out. The only two areas that I say I've done a lot in around here are Frederick County, uh, Virginia, and then what I did to, you know, just for this on the shale barrens. I think any place you need to try to find as much from the historical record as you can to find out where these were, and then look at what the disturbance factors might be. And I think it's always going to be a combination of the two. Uh, the the mid-post-glacial mid warm period certainly caused warmer climates. It didn't, it didn't result anywhere, as far as I know, in large-scale sort of deforestation conversion of forest to prairie. In, uh, in most of, and certainly in the Ridge and Valley province. So I'm not sure just uh, when those species came in, we really don't know. Uh, certainly, I think, I think they certainly came in probably in the, in the glacial period, but, but I have no strong evidence for that. So there are lots of questions out there. And I guess one, one thing I was, I'm trying to sort of talk about, I love meadows. I just think meadows are great and my goodness, they certainly are so far superior to lawns. I don't understand why people would spend all that effort to mow and have this green lawn with nothing living in it. It's, you might as well put out AstroTurf. But I think in terms of conservation, 
and, and the rare species, it would be so important to put the effort into areas that do have odd soils, like the shale barrens, or like the uh, serpentine barrens, uh, these areas along uh, the limestone creeks in Frederick County, uh, which have a long history of being open. So, um, so I, I can't answer that question for sure, but I can give you some directions of, of how to get, try, try to answer it you know, yourself. We have many more questions. Your presentation has generated a lot of interest. I'm going to skip ahead to a couple of areas uh, that have not been covered previously. One question is, what about bogs and wetlands? Is that a more recent landscape typology in the mid-Atlantic? Uh, no, I think bogs, any bogs and wetlands that are there have probably been there for quite a while. During the full glacial, it's not just that it was colder, but there were there were there was a lot of snow and ice. There were there were I've I've looked at some uh, sediments that were formed where there must have been some kind of a depression. I don't know what caused it, but it had spruce and pine growing in a depression and probably bog species. But I think, for example, Cranesville, the, that core indicated that that bog has been there for a long time. Bogs generally develop to become less boggy. That is, they fill in and they become drier over time. Uh, I did also, I have seen a, um, a, a, a fen, I, I should say fen, that these are not raised bogs um, in Pennsylvania that looks, looks like a, just a gorgeous, Old fen. It has uh, it has pitcher plants and it has uh, sundews. It has all the things you'd expect to see. Turns out it was a spruce forest that was logged about 50 years ago and has developed into an open fen. And if you look at it, you think it's a fen. So that is a new a new fen, um, and it's picked up a lot of those species that are characteristic. So I think most, there are, the old ones, the old ones are drying up slowly, but it's a very slow process. And I don't know that I've answered the question. I didn't repeat it either, I'm sorry. The question had to do with, with fens and bogs and wetlands. There aren't that many of them in this region. Um, back to pollen. Where have pollen cores in the Washington, D.C. area been obtained and studied? Uh, the one I had there in the Chesapeake Bay is probably the closest. Um, there have been cores in closer to um, the Baltimore area, but they, I, they're a little harder to find. And they're usually only a few, like about a thousand years maybe worth of sediment. But there's, as I said, there simply are no at no appropriate basins, sedimentary basins, for accumulating sediment to study with pollen. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's really, it would be absolutely great. And there are a lot of sort of wet areas. Most of those dry out every, who knows, every 10, 15 years, it's often enough for the pollen to be destroyed. And you could try, you might find one. I, could, I, I have, Cored two sites in one in Delaware near Dover and one near in, in New Jersey, south of the Wisconsin Terminal Moraine, which were wetlands. And we went through a sort of mucky, you know, a sort of a gly soil. And underneath that, we found a meter and a half of, of heat yuck. So it was a lake sediment. And it turned out that that sediment had formed, that had been a depression in the full early post glacial period represented about 1,500 years of spruce and pine and, uh, and tundra plants. And then it was truncated at the top. So it, one of them went like to 13,000 years ago and one went to 12,000. So you can, you can put a lot of holes in a lot of places and the probability is you won't find anything, but you never know. Maybe you can get lucky. Uh, the next question is, is the oral and or written history by Native peoples extensive? And if so, 
Does it shed any light on open spaces in the Mid-Atlantic? I haven't seen any that did. I, I mainly, I haven't looked at that since I've been in Virginia. And uh, the, the thing is, this whole region was reasonably well populated by Native Americans several hundred years before Europeans arrived here. But, mo but those, those populations dwindled very rapidly, perhaps in response to the Little Ice Age, no one really, which was a cold period from about 1450 or so to 1850. Nobody knows for sure, but for example, there are extensive um, uh, archeological deposits along the Opecan River between Clark and Frederick counties in Virginia, but there were no people living there when European settlers arrived. So that the ethnographic evidence is pretty hard to find because those people, the people you talk to were the coastal people. Um, and I don't, I simply don't know in Virginia. I haven't, I haven't read those. I did read all the ethnographic material I could in, in New Jersey. And there was never any reference to the use of fire except ceremonially or something like that, but not for maintaining landscapes. So I haven't seen it. Doesn't mean it's not there. We have a couple of questions of a very general nature um, about uh, particular species. These two are not really related. One is where do the native meadow plants in the Maryland Piedmont fit in with the historical forest setting? And then another question is whether you have any thoughts about Osage Orange. Okay, native, uh, one question had to do with the native meadow plants, and that's what I've basically been trying to talk about, is where were these plants? We know they're here. Uh, we're pretty sure they were here. They weren't brought in by people in the last 200 years. And so where were they in the, in the pre-colonial landscape? And I'm, I'm proposing, my feeling is that they were in these sites that were unusual and unusual enough that poor enough soils or conditions, <clears throat> I didn't mention uh, steep slopes of which there aren't you know, that many right, right around here, but you get out in the mountains, there's certainly steep slopes. Uh, they were in those habitats. I think, I know some people attribute these to being here because of Native Americans set fires, but I think that sort of begs the question because they evolved a long time ago. And before, they, they evolved before the last ice age, certainly, and uh, there weren't any people here at that point. So they, there's, they, they evolved without people setting fires and, and providing them with habitat. Their habitat may have been expanded by Native Americans using fire, uh, managing certain areas um, with fire. So that might have been where they were. I, I, one thing I find difficult is some of them are, of course, in these meadows that are on good soils. But I, I don't, and you can think maybe they were blowdowns, so you had good soils, but you had a huge storm. And the only experiment I know that's tried to figure out what happens with a big storm is the Harvard University, uh, Harvard Forest study of their simulated, um, simulated hurricane, where they actually attached cables. They got baseline data, they set up plots, and then they had a bunch of foresters come out with cables and a whole acre, they pulled down all the trees. And then they recorded what happened in the fall, just when the hurricane would have hit. And then they recorded what happened. There was never any bare soil. Shrubs filled in, trees sprouted. Those don't create very good open sites. So uh, this is, I'm you know, still trying to figure out where these might have been. And the second part of that question I'm trying to. Um, was before this, we go back to that. Yeah. I have a follow up question. When you talked about finding the traces of pollen from upland herbs, was it possible to identify any particular species? Were they as distinctive as the pollen grains that you showed? 
Um, that, that's a really good question. And uh, you can frequently, very frequently identify those. You certainly can identify the family. So the sort of um, uh, sedge area, the, the, the tundra that I did in, in Delaware and New Jersey, I, I, had, uh, I had a whole variety of, of different species, lobelias, and um, I can't think of any names right now. Anyway, I had a lot of different families represented. And within those, you can certainly find certain genera. One of the problems is you can find a pollen grain and you can look at it, do a reference slide of that pollen, that plant. You do a reference slide of a plant, you say, aha, this is what the pollen looks like. And then you see it in a slide and you say, aha, I found it. But, it, but unless you've done all of the genera, all of the species, you aren't sure, you can't be sure you're correct. Uh, for example, the Asteraceae, a lot of the Asteraceae have very, very similar pollen. And you can see a pollen grain that looks really distinctive. Say, ah, I know that, I've got that genus or even species. But then if you really look at pollen of other similar genera and species, you look at their pollen and you find, uh, maybe it's not. So it's a little difficult to get very precise. It requires a huge reference collection. And unfortunately, I didn't mention this, but not that many people are doing this these days. It's very tedious work and it's not, uh, you, you really can't automate it. There have been lots of efforts to automate it. So, uh, but you do, I, I just say, there are most of those um, upland herbaceous plants, the reason they know they're herbaceous plants is they identify them to genus and they're, I mean, to family and they're in families that don't have any trees. Um, that other question was whether you had any thoughts about Osage Orange. Yeah, Osage Orange. As far as I know, Osage Orange is native only to Oklahoma and I think maybe a little bit of Texas anyway down there. And it was planted up here in the, certainly in the 19th, maybe even the 18th century, I'm not sure, um, as what they thought was going to be a living hedge because it was a very they, in England, you had these things called laid hedges. Uh, they're, they're reviving those because it's a historic uh, hedge type. And you let a plant grow up a little ways. And usually it was a plant with prickers of some kind, some kind of thorns. And then you sliced it the side of it and you laid it down horizontally and tied it. And so you ended up with a living hedge. And I think originally they thought they were going to be able to do that with Osage Orange and make living hedges. It unfortunately did not respond very well to that treatment. So you ended up with just uh, hedgerows of Osage Oranges. But those were all planted. Uh, um, and I don't think, I haven't seen that many, I haven't seen them uh, seeding themselves, but maybe other people have. One more question. Uh, what do you think the pre-colonial deer population was like compared to the very low deer population mid 20th century and very high in recent decades? Okay, so this is a question about the deer population. I, I think the deer population was probably fairly low in the pre-colonial, mainly because it was mostly forested. That is, if you agree that the evidence is strong, that it was mostly forest. Deer populations are fairly low in a continuously forested landscape. I talked to one of the rangers at Shenandoah National Park. We were talking about invasive species and problems, and I brought up deer, and he said, oh, there are problems near the roads and near the camps, you know, the campgrounds and near the developed areas. But if you get way out in the woods, the forest, he said, they're not a problem because if it's an extensive forest, the populations are fairly low. But probably as with um, today, there were these open barrens or cane breaks, that kind of site, which is areas which were not forested and which would provide more grazing for the deer. I know they're browsers, but they certainly graze around here in the, in the pastures all the time. So that would have increased the local populations. And then of course, when European settlers came in, they destroyed all the cover 
and they shot most of them and uh, and that's why we had this low population. In some areas, of course, they were brought in. The reason we have a very the very successful reintroduction of deer. Well, Emily, I want to thank you for a very fascinating presentation. And there have been a number of comments in the Q&A and in the chat uh, thanking you um, not only for your presentation, but for uh, your patience in answering all these questions in a very complete and informative way. Uh, one person said, your work is an inspired amalgam of very different disciplines, history and ecology. And I think that sums it up very well. So thank you again. And thank you everyone for attending our webinar. Well, I love that. And I just want to add one thing. If people want, still have questions and would like to communicate with me, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can communicate with me through my Hood College uh, email address, which is just southgate at hood.edu. And I'd be glad to answer questions or uh, talk with you more that way. I love the questions. Yes, they were great. Thank you, attendees. Um, we're going to end the webinar now.